We praise the Father, we praise the Son, and we praise the Holy Spirit. God, we're so grateful for Jesus. We're grateful for his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, we surrender everything we are to you. And we declare that you are holy, that you are mighty, that you are glorious. Lord, would you speak to us now through your word? Would you open up our eyes and ears to what you have for us this morning? It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray in the church of God said, amen. amen and amen. Thank you so much for singing with us. You can take a seat. So I'm sitting in this nice office out in Katy. It's just one of those kinds of offices has like lots of mahogany furniture. Um, the, the couch sofa I'm sitting on is some kind of floral print that I'm pretty sure my grandmother had. It's got enough pillows on there where I'm thinking about my kids where they can like probably build an epic pillow fort on it. And across from me is this gentleman that's um, several decades older than me and um, I'd been in a men's group with and um, through a couple of conversations, he said, why don't you come by my office later this evening? So I'm sitting there and he's like, what, what's going on with you lately? So I just sat for about 25 minutes and recounted the previous two years of my life. In those two years, I had started a new church with my wife and a handful of friends. And it was a time when 80% of new churches failed. The odds were stacked against us. And I felt that every week as people came and people went and you struggle through to become financially self-sufficient and you struggle with uh, as being a, uh, a young pastor who had just been a youth minister and a, and a teacher, but now I was involved in all these things and it was just a lot of pressure, a lot of, a lot of stuff coming at me and just kind of figuring all that out and from the church member that was hurting to the church member that... Um, was a little difficult to deal with. Um, I buried my father over those two years. I had taken care of my mother. We were raising two small children and had a new one on the way and at the time was probably one of my wife's um, more strenuous pregnancies. So I'm sitting through there telling all this to him and in between laughing, I'm going back and forth from laughing and crying and like, can you believe? And this is great. But this is awful and all these things. And finally I'm done and I look across at him and say, you got any advice? You got anything for me? This man, his name was Dick Conant and Dick was the founder of the Houston Center for Christian Counseling. He looked at me at this very gentle expression. He said, that's a lot, Chuck. And I was like, I should be a counselor. You get paid the big bucks to say the obvious, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and I went on with some more. I was like, yeah, but and I was just saying stuff for I don't know how long. And, and he just looked at me and stopped me. He said, Chuck, you know you're depressed, right? And I was like, really? No. Nah. Between 280 and 300 million people in the world suffer from depression. 19 million Americans suffer from it. This time, in any given year, 6% of men and 10% of women will experience a depressive episode. That leads, depression many times will lead to a terrible ending in suicide, which is still the leading cause of violent death, deaths worldwide. Depression is a true matter that people face. And what kind of people face it? People with a pulse. If you're new with us, we're in week four of a message series called Let's Talk About It. We're talking about things the local churches normally talk about. We've talked about anxiety, anger, grief and loss. Next week we're going to talk about doubt, and then we'll end the series talking about addiction. And this morning we're going to talk about depression. Now there's a depression chapter in the Bible. We can't turn to Hesitations chapter four, and it says what to do when you're depressed. The Bible's not that way. It is, remember, an ancient document, and it's really a story. It's a story that is telling you the story of God and the story of his revelation to the world. And in the midst of this story, we see something, whether, I don't know what you believe about the Bible, but um, whatever you believe, you got, if you're intellectually honest, you at least believe this. 
it is very honest about how hard life is. It will show you people going through horrific things. And it will show you people going through depressive time periods, episodes. From Jeremiah to Job to David. They will just go through all these people that are, that are struggling and having this, these depressive episodes. And as I looked at different passages, I came back to this one. And it's, it's great because he's a spiritual giant in his day. He's the kind of guy, that guy doesn't get depressed. He's the guy that all of y'all would probably come up to me after the service and say, hey, you listen to this guy's podcast? He's great. Like, thanks. I guess you're saying I'm not. But no, 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 I'm not that self-consumed. But, you know, it's like, it, it, it's like, no, he's awesome and he never has a bad day. He's that kind of guy you would probably think that about. And he is a spiritual giant. But he goes as low as anyone can go. All within a matter of days of his greatest spiritual triumphs. If you have a Bible, if you'll turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to look at an episode from the life of the prophet Elijah today. Now, before we jump into 1 Kings 19, you got to know what's just happened. Elijah is speaking to Israel in a time where Israel's rebelling. They have this King Ahab who, quote, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And his wife Jezebel, she didn't do much better. She spurred a lot of that on and was just as bad. And so they did a lot of things they, uh, that are they're evil and horrible. They worship false gods, especially the god Baal. Well, God, one of the things that God did to show his discipline to Israel, to show a sign that they have rejected him, is he told Elijah to say, hey, it's not going to rain. There's going to be a, a, a drought and of course, we've experienced a drought, but they experienced a drought as an agricultural society without all the technology we have today. So it was definitely detrimental to them. And then there was a challenge where Elijah challenged Ahab to bring the prophets of Baal. And they had this little contest where basically Elijah said, we'll build these altars and we'll ask our gods to bring down fire from heaven. Whichever God does, that's God, right? And so they did that. The Baal prophets did their part. Nothing happened. Elijah prays one prayer and fire falls from heaven. And then there's a moment where Israel, you know, renews itself, uh, takes, takes swords up against the prophets of Baal. All these things happen. And it's this crazy, amazing moment. The next thing that happens is Elijah goes to a mountaintop and prays for rain to fall. And rain comes back. So he's seen fire fall from heaven. He's seen a drought ended and God sent rain. You would think this guy is going places. And this guy is probably about to see a renewal, revival. Probably the king and queen have fled. The evil king and queen have left the country and gone somewhere else. Or they have repented. So Elijah heads to the capital city, Jezreel. And he's expecting people to turn back to God. He's expecting repentance. He's expecting something. What he gets is not what he expected. Chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more so if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Now you might say they killed all the prophets. That seems pretty harsh. But you got to remember prophets in the Old Testament aren't like preachers today. They weren't just speakers of the Lord, but many times they were leaders of the community. They, they also you know, gave out God's justice and things like that. And it was definitely a wartime culture they were in, much different than it is today. But Jezebel is basically saying, listen, one of us is dead tomorrow. And may, may the gods do that to me if I don't have you dead by this time tomorrow. Now, Elijah is called fire from heaven. He asked God to bring fire. Elijah prayed and rain came. You would think the next response would be, he's going to pray and he's not going to be affected by this. That's not his response. Verse 3, then he was afraid and he rose, arose and ran for his life. He came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself, when a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. So Elijah had hoped 
Did not happen. What he expected, it went the opposite way. He basically runs for his life, fires his staff, goes a little bit further, finds a tree to sit down, and just says, I'm done, God. Take my life. Elijah's down. He's got the blues. You could maybe say he's depressed. He's definitely not happy. He even goes so far to compare himself to his fathers. He said, I'm no better than my fathers. He's talking about Israel and all their sin. He goes, I'm no better than all these other sinners. Just take away my life. I'm done. When you look at the causes of depression, there's about four main causes. Biological, uh, there's chemical imbalance, chronic pain, nutrition deficiency, hormonal changes, lack of sleep, exercise, lack of sunlight, lack of exercise rather, lack of sunlight, and postpartum. Some of you are like, yeah, when I exercise, I get depressed. No, 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 lack of exercise. All right, stay focused. And then there, there's relational causes, you know, betrayal, rejection, divorce, isolation. Uh, the numbers of depressed Americans, you know, skyrocket, really people around the world over the, the lockdown during the pandemic. Circumstantial causes of depression can be death or loss, trauma, bankruptcy, retirement, maybe your kids leaving home, some kind of big family change. And then there's spiritual causes to depression. Sometimes when we sin and we are kind of, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you and you're quenching the Spirit by sinning, it may feel good for a little bit, but it can, it can make you kind of feel down. It can make you feel upset. And every day we're faced with a spiritual battle with a real enemy who can make us feel blah and blue. But what we have to realize is depression is not punishment from God. Depression is something that God may allow you to go through as he went, allowed Elijah to go through. Now today as we walk through his story, I'm not a doctor or a licensed counselor. I'm a pastor. I just want to pastor you through this story. You may need to go see a counselor. Uh, I saw the counselor I mentioned, Dick Conant, for several years until he moved. And now I see another counselor who I've seen for over 10 years now, at least once a month, to check in and just talk about my life and the good parts, the bad parts. Sometimes they're short conversations and sometimes the hour flew by. I've got so much more to say. There's a lot of different ways to face depression, but we're going to talk about it from a biblical, hopeful way. Now, Christians get weird when it comes to depression. Sometimes you'll find Christians that say, well, it's a sin to be depressed. You have no verse for that. Your arguments are straw arguments. There are countless biblical characters that show otherwise that God is not upset and God does not say you're in sin because you're depressed. And what happens is we get weird and we talk about it in ways that aren't accurate, that aren't biblical, that aren't helpful, and sadly sometimes that aren't even kind. John Lockley in his book, A Practical Workbook for the Depressed Christian, writes, being depressed is bad enough in itself, but being a depressed Christian is worse. And being a depressed Christian in a church full of people who do not understand depression is like a little taste of hell. Some of you felt that. Some of you had that before. I've had that before. But here at our church, we want to just talk about it accurately in a way that's helpful and biblical. Because here's the reality. It is okay not to be okay. But here's also the other side of that reality. It's not okay to stay that way. Because Jesus is always leading to light and life and hope and change. And so you may be like Elijah and go, I'm just about done. But the good news of the story of the scripture is, God is not done with you, even when you are done with you. Amen. God's not done with you, friend. I don't know who needs to hear that today. Somebody in this room needs to hear that. God is not done with you. He has more. He has more. Your situation may feel hopeless, but with God, there is always hope. Let's see some of the hope that he gives us. So verse 5. And he, Elijah, lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. 
And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. First thing we see about hope for depression in this story is we need to receive God's care. Receive God's care for you mentally, physically, and spiritually. Because God cares about us holistically. Sometimes sometimes we have this idea, God just cares about the spiritual parts of my life. But the scriptures would show us that there is no part of our lives that God does not care about. He has given us bodies. The psalmist says he gives sleep to those those he loves. He cares about our sleep. Every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights, James tells us in his letter in the New Testament. There's no part of our life that God doesn't care about. Jesus can't touch and the spirit can't heal and renew. And God cares enough for him. He sends this angel. Now we don't, most likely, most of us probably had never had an angel come to us because God has given us something better than an angel. He has given us the Holy Spirit, his very self, his very presence. And that presence, we don't just experience maybe in a room like this when we're singing songs or praying. The care of the Holy Spirit can be experienced in all kinds of ways. It is a spiritual thing to take care of our physical needs. Notice that Elijah is sleeping and the angel doesn't like come over and wake him up and say, get up, you lazy bum. Now, sure, depression can lead to oversleeping. Depression can lead to not sleeping. But sometimes when you're just down, you're feeling the blues, you might just need a nap because sleep is restorative. Notice the angel doesn't like come and give him a sermon. He actually bakes him a cake. Now, don't think three layers, you know, icing, your favorite thing. Like, oh, yeah. Now, think like a nice roll, okay? <laughs> this is not that kind of cake. Uh, more like, you know, if we were in England, it'd be a biscuit or something like that, you know, or something, you know, whatever. But it's just, it's something of substance to help strengthen him. And he, he gives him that. And he lets him sleep. And he cares for him mentally physically, and spiritually. And so he doesn't start preaching. And that teaches us that when we encounter people that are down, we encounter people that say they're depressed, we encounter people that say they're sad, we should not say stupid things. I mean, that's just like, you know, I try to say that in different sermons in this message about, because I want to weed out the whole idea of, of any stupid thoughts we have that we think, well, I can help and fix people. You can't fix people. It's better just to be quiet and say, I'm so sorry and care for them. There's a time to speak truth, but maybe not right in the heat of the moment when they're telling you they're depressed. So we don't say things like, pull yourself together. We don't say things like, you've got nothing to be sad about. We don't say things like, don't get so emotional. We don't say things like, oh, you'll get over it. You sure don't say things like, it's a sin to be depressed. You you don't say, you know, don't just give out kind of spiritual, biblical kind of wishes and platitudes that you don't tie to a verse and you don't really understand the meaning. And you just say things like, well, just believe the promises and plead the blood and rebuke the devil. They all have smidgens and elements of truth in them comes from the scripture, but you're just throwing them out like little phrases and wishes and you're not entering into, there's some reality and depth in there that that probably should be addressed, but also people's depression and sadness can be very complicated and and, and not just you're saying a little phrase is going to whisk it away. We don't say things like, well, things could be worse. And you don't look at someone and say, well, are you taking your medication?" We look at this angel and we go, you know what? Maybe I just need to say, how can I serve you? How can I care for you? What do you need from me? You need me to just sit here? Can I bring you a meal? Can I buy you a coffee? Can I, you know, what can I do? And that's part of God's care for us. He cares for us spiritually. We'll see it as we walk through the story. He cares for us mentally. We're going to see it as we walk through the story. But he also cares for us physically. So I'm sitting on this sofa this floral sofa with all these pillows, propping my arms up, kind of pseudo hiding behind in every session with Dick. And one of the sessions, we're talking about stuff. We've talked about prayer. We've talked about my family of origin. We've talked about all kinds of things. And I was talking to him about my life and my schedule and my pace of life. He goes, Chuck, when do you, what do you do to give your soul a bump? I was like, excuse me? 
I, that, I don't know what that means. That sounds weird. He said, well, if this is the day the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it, how do you practice that? I sing that little song and thank God for this day in my prayer. And how's that working for you? And my days suck. It's not really working for me. Okay, so then how can you be glad in the Lord today? What is the way that God has made you that if you just took 10 minutes to say, thank you, Lord, and you did this thing, it would just make your soul feel a little better. And I had the thought, and he's like, whatever it is, just say it. I was like, I love books. I love to walk around a bookstore. The only thing I read right now is for my sermons because I don't have time. I got little kids. I got busy schedule. He said, what if a couple of times a week you just went to Barnes & Noble and you walked around for 10 minutes? I don't have time for that. He's like, you got to make time because that's going to care for you physically. God made you that way and just receive his care as you walk around. I put it on my calendar. It was like an appointment. I did it a couple of times a week. I always walked out feeling better. My mind was a little clearer. I was a little bit happier. I didn't go home grumpy. And I think that was a spiritual moment with the Lord. That he walked with me around Barnes & Noble. I think he cares about every part of our lives. And the walking is very important because if you notice, he does all this physical caring. And in verse 8, it says, He arose, ate, and drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. It doesn't say, and after he ate, the angel touched him, and a lightning bolt zapped him, and Elijah was like, I'm happy now. <laughs> he then said, let's go for a walk. God can zap you, friends. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to set people free right here, right now. He can break in. I think he can do that probably more than we in Western civilization think he can, allow him to, and ask him to. But many times in this kind of area, in our mental and emotional health, he doesn't always zap us. He says, let's go for a walk. And coming out of depression is a journey. It's a journey, not an event. Then we get to verse 9. There, at the Mount of God, he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Which is such a great question, because don't you want to say, Well, I walked with you here, you know? Like, I, 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 I was back there, and you, we went, you gave me cake, and now we're here. I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, what are we talking about? When God asks a location question, he knows your location. In Genesis chapters, in chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, he was walking in the garden. He said, where are you? It's not because he didn't know where they were. He's not asking a physical location question. He's asking a soul location question. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you looking for? What's going on under the hood? Verse 10, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even only I am left, and they seek my life to take it away. God, I'm your prophet, and I'm the only one. Everybody's gone but me, and they're trying to kill me. He just it goes to number two, where we share your feelings with God and others. He's just saying, he's selling what's true. He'll say it again in just a few verses. And, and we've talked about this throughout this series, but it's such an important thing not to miss that part of dealing with anything with the Lord and our emotional and mental health is to just pour out what's in us to God, not what ought to be in us. God cannot transform the person you are pretending to be. He can only transform who you are. So in prayer, you have to be who you are. Bring the real, true you to God and say, this is how I feel. This is who I am. And he knows that. He's not asking because he doesn't know it. He's asking because there's something healing in confession and in the conversation. 
And he can do this in your private prayer life. He can do this in community. He can do this with a counselor. And in that moment, you can just hear God saying again and again to you, there is hope. Because remember, God is not done with you, even when you are done with you. So verse 11, and he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. That's a fascinating sentence. Why would he do that? Because he thought, based on earthquake, wind, fire, that the unfiltered presence of Yahweh is right outside that tent. And if I look at him, I'm dead. So he wraps his head so he cannot see the Lord because he doesn't want to die. And then he walks out to where the Lord is. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. And, and jealous means that his heart is just focused on him. Not that unhealthy jealousy that you think about in like relationships, but this is just more like my heart is his and I want, want him to be known. For the people of Israel forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and I, even only I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And then notice what God says to him next. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehoah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. What's going on? This leads to our third thing. Confront your false thoughts and defer to God's wisdom. Elijah has thoughts. Elijah has thoughts. Are I'm the only one. You don't understand. It's just me, God. And God's like, calm down, my friend. I got another king I'm about to put in place. I've got your replacement that's coming down the line. You're going to mentor. And I've got 7,000 people you don't know about that have not kissed Baal and given and bowed to him. Because when we get depressed, many times when we're dealing with sadness, when we're dealing with stuff, you, you can just have these thoughts that are they're very inward focused and, and, they're, and you have these feelings that are real, but they're not necessarily true. And you got to have your thoughts confronted and you got to defer to God's wisdom in, in, in all of life. And so he's having to defer to God's wisdom here. And God's saying, no, 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 let me tell you about reality, Elijah. And, he, and you may say, like, that seems uncaring, but, but it's very caring to say, no, here's what's true. Walk in truth. Walk in truth. When I was seeing Dick, I'm sitting on this couch, and I'm holding a pillow one night, and we're having this discussion, and things get pretty heated. Not heated as an argument, but heated as in we've hit a tender spot. I start talking about my dad, and I mentioned my dad last week in his passing, but I didn't mention this. The couple of years before my dad passed, I had been challenged in a discipleship group I was in. Is there any relationship that I, that's, not, that's out of alignment with where probably God wants it to be? And right away, I knew it was my dad. I had some interesting experiences around that. I can tell another time. Um, but really, the, the challenge was, okay, engage your dad. And it's not like we were, he wasn't an abusive dad. He was a good man. We, we just were different people and we had just kind of grown apart. And he had some ways that irritated me and I had some ways that he didn't understand. I mean, like for instance, you know, he didn't understand my job. So he called me throughout the day, uh, during the week. And I'd answer the phone. Hey dad, go, what are you doing? I'm working. You only work one day a week. So I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> well, <sighs> father... You know, so stuff like that. So I have been working on this for a couple of years. So we started the church. They hadn't, I've told this story before, but they hadn't gone to church in years. 
They started coming to Crossbridge. Every Sunday morning, we're at the Sartarshan Middle School where we started. I'm checking my microphone, you know, check one, check two, because we had to set up the sound system every week. My parents walk in because they got everywhere 30 minutes early. And, um, <laughs> and so they walk in, and he comes right in front of me on the, sta- or the stage, and he stands there looking at me. Check, my check one, two, does that sound good? Yeah, t- keep talking, Check. we got reverb issue, and we're doing all that. And finally, I'm like, yeah, Dad, just telling you I'm here. <laughs> Thanks. You know, it's like, you know, I'm shaking people's hands as everyone's leaving, trying to meet all these new people because we're starting a new church and they want to have a conversation. Like, I love y'all. Can you ever just, you know, and it's like, it's, so it's just stuff like that. Easter, our very first Easter, they come to that Easter service. And that afternoon, they come to our house and we're outside and I'm pushing my daughter Margaret on the swing. And my dad and I have a conversation like we've never had before. I won't share the details with you. It's pretty intimate. But there was a moment where I was like, what just happened? And even as they were leaving to go home, he said something. He just said, he talked in a way to me he had never talked. Just affirming and life-giving. And I was like, what is that? That was amazing. And that was Easter. So the summer goes through, more conversation. What are you doing? You know, God, I'm just telling you I'm here. All that's, you know, all going on. There's days where I'm just like, I didn't react. I didn't sin. That was great. Other days I hang up the phone just like that, man. You know, and just all this stuff and all these things. And then comes the first year anniversary of the church, and we're going to have a baptism, our very first baptism. And so I talk about it. You should get baptized. In fact, we're going to do a, first, a baptism on the first Sunday in November. Some of y'all should get baptized. Um, that's like a real announcement. Um, and, and so I, I'm talking about it. And so my dad calls me, goes, uh, calls me and says, I need to talk to you. Okay. I want to get baptized. Now, I'm just going to be real honest with you. Some of you may decide we need to find another church after I tell you this. I can recommend some great ones. Okay. Um, I was just like, oh, man, don't ruin our first baptism. What are you doing? So thankfully, by God's mercy, I got my composure and said, all right, Dad, I'm just going to talk to you like I talk to anybody else that wants to get baptized. And he's like, yeah, yeah, treat me like anyone else. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, has there ever come a time in your life, Dad, where Jesus has become real to you and you surrendered your life to him and he became your Savior and Lord? And then he told me a story I had never heard in all my 32 years at that time. Because when I was stationed in Germany in the, in the 60s, I went to a chapel service with a buddy of mine, and there was this guy up there talking. The chaplain was talking and preaching, and he talked about the gospel and Jesus. And in that moment, I knew I needed to surrender my life and give my heart and life to Jesus and ask him to forgive me of my sins. I looked at my buddy and said, will you go up there with me and talk to the chaplain? And my buddy said yes. And so we went up there, and I prayed with my buddy and that chaplain and asked Jesus into my life on that day. I mean, I'm having like multiple like out of body experiences and conversations. I'm writing it down, mm hmm, taking notes like on the inside, like what in the freaking world, you know? I want I want to hang up the phone. It's like Kathleen, get out of here! You won't believe what you just said, you know? I'm just like all this. I'm making side notes. Talk to Dick about this on Tuesday, you know? All this kind of stuff is happening right there, and I just have composure enough to say, "Well, Dad, I didn't know what else to say. What happened, (laughs) you know? Because that's not how we've been living, you know, or how we live my life." And he just said, Chuck, I, I, I kind of wondered from the Lord many times. I tried to take us back to church a few times, and I had my faults, and I pushed him away, but I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to get baptized so everyone can see that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I mean, what do you say to that except, all right, I'll see you Sunday night because we baptized at a a pool back then. We didn't have the holy horse trough, if you've ever seen that before. (laughs) So I baptized him in September. And I buried him in October. And so I'm talking to Dick, and I'm on that couch holding that pillow with the little tassels all around it, and I'm, I'm, I'm filling one of those tassels, and I'm just like, why would God do that? I have a breakthrough with him, and then he lets me hear about his salvation, which for 32 years, Dick, I never heard anything like that. And then a month later, he's dead? That doesn't sound kind or good. And Dick, being the counselor, is like, hmm. (laughs) He's a professional, you know. And he pauses, 
And I know I probably crossed the line. I'm probably going to lose my job. The earth's going to open up and swallow me right here. It's all over for me. He said, Chuck, I think maybe you're looking at this all wrong. How long do you think your dad had cancer? Probably a long time because he never went to the doctor. Smoked all his life. And it was everywhere by the time they found it. He goes, yeah, probably a long time. And what if it's not God's, you know, meanness that took your dad? What if it was his, just his kindness that let you have that conversation on Easter? And his kindness that allowed you to hear his salvation story. So when he died, you knew he was with Jesus. And then he let you, his firstborn son, have the honor to baptize him at the church you pastored. What if this is not God being mean, but this is his wonderful kindness to you? And that probably all made sense to all of y'all. But for me, I was just like, oh, that is a different way to look at it. It's the right way to look at it. It had to confront my false thoughts about and defer to God's wisdom. That every good and perfect gift is from him. He's good and gracious and caring. And God doesn't owe me anything, but look how kind he was. So in that, we got to confront these thoughts and we can't make friends with, with, with false, unhealthy thoughts. We have to fight them. Martin Luther said, depression is not something you surrender to, but something that you fight. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a British pastor and physician, says, you take yourself by the hand and you turn on yourself and you tell yourself, hope in God. Do what's true. Believe what's true. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. He's talking to himself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Don't believe these false thoughts. Put your hope back on him. You may not feel it now, but I shall again praise him. You got to become your own favorite preacher. You got to be able to preach to yourself, not just listen to yourself. Okay, life is terrible. I feel this way. I feel that way. Uh, the culture says if I feel this way, I must be that way. This is what you, you got to stop that and go, no, no, no. Soul, here's what's true. You are in Christ. And in Christ, you're accepted by God. In Christ, I'm never alone. He is with me. In Christ, I am free from the bondage of sin. In Christ, I have the authority to resist and expel the powers of darkness. In Christ, my future is bright. These feelings are not ultimate reality. I will be happy and have joy again, if not in this life, yes, in the next, because goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. You got to become your own favorite preacher and you got to preach to your soul and confront the false thoughts that you have. And deferring to God's wisdom means you act on it. That's why Elijah has something to do. Elijah, here's what's true. Let's live like this. You're not the only one, pal. I fed you. You had a nap. I've walked with you on this journey. I've come to you in a tender whisper. But you got to do what I'm telling you to do now. Act on my wisdom and truth. And then fourthly and finally, abide in the love and grace of God. Now, you may notice we skipped over the whole wind, earthquake, fire, you know, all that kind of stuff. But if you go back and you look again, let's go back. Zach, can you come back to verse 11 for me? If you can find that for me. And he said, God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. In Hebrew, that could also be translated a thin silence. Now, in the scripture, they don't put that kind of detail unless they're trying to tell you something. What are they trying to tell you? What is, it, what, is the, what is the biblical authors trying to tell us here? That God's coming to Elijah in a different way. How does God usually show up in the Old Testament? Wind, fire, earthquakes, 
dramatic. The wind, he blew apart the Red Sea and let the Israelites cross. And then with his wind, he blew it back together and drowned the Egyptian army. Moses goes to the mountain to get the law. What happens? The earth shakes and fire comes. What did Elijah just do? He called fire from heaven. Oh, God, if you're the one true God, show these people you're the one true God. And fire comes. Fire, wind, earthquake, all signs of God's judgment. But the Lord is not in that for Elijah. He comes in a low whisper. Now, if I were to whisper to you, I mean, right now is a microphone. But if we were standing next to each other and I had a very low whisper, a thin silence, what would you have, if I, if I couldn't speak up, this is all I had, was a low, thin silence. How would you hear me then? What would you have to do? Get closer. Come real close to whisper tender words because it doesn't say here that all this conversation is what he said in the low whisper because remember he heard the low whisper and then he walked out of the cave and had this conversation what he heard in the low whisper the biblical writers say you'll have to learn that another day maybe in heaven you'll hear that so we see all that there, and you see that God has come to him tenderly in this whisper. And you think, well, how can I experience a whisper? How can I experience that? Does God have that for me? Oh, friend, he has more than a whisper for you. Because years later, in a story in the Gospels, there is a moment where Jesus goes on a mountain with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to go up to pray. And in that moment, Jesus' appearance changed. He becomes on fire, like lightning, the text says. And then appears Elijah and Moses. Wind and earthquake fire guys. Like earth, wind, and fire, if you remember that band. Okay? <laughs> Only people over 40 laughed at that joke. Um, they're there. And then a cloud comes down, the cloud being God's glory. The top two guys representing the law and the prophets, the cloud representing the Shekinah glory. Heaven has now invaded earth. Jesus' appearance completely changing. And the next thing says, a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. He's the whisper. He's the whisper that knows what it means to be abandoned by God because on the cross he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Abandoned in your place and my place for our sin. He's the whisper who said, I have to leave and I'm leaving because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, God's empowering presence. He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will, he will remind you of the things I've said. He will guide you into all truth. He says all this in John's gospel. If you've been with us, we studied so much of that before this series. And Jesus is the intimate voice of God, the word made flesh. Come to earth to show us the love and the grace of God. And we just have to remember in these moments, whatever you need to do, whatever you got to read, wherever you got to go, whatever you got to do, stay with him. Don't leave him. Don't buy the lie that depression means he has forsaken you. That's a lie from hell. He has never left you, never forsaken you. He's not judging you. Christ was judged in your place. He has come close to you by his grace and love and the Holy Spirit. Be reminded of this, friends. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, including depression, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus and our Lord. So nothing, friends, not your anxiety, not your panic attacks, not your anger, not your doubt, not your addiction, not your depression, not your unbelieving family, not your workplace, not the 21st century secularism we find ourselves in, not your nightmares, not the media, nothing especially your depression, nothing and no one can separate you from the love he has for you. <laughs> and all you have to do is just show up and say, God, I need you. I need you now. 
You're the same God. He's the God of Elijah. And he wants to come close to you and whisper his love in your heart. And that may be some supernatural experience, but also, friends, his whisper, his breath. You know what it says about this book, don't you? In the book of 2 Timothy, it says that it's God-breathed, that this is his, the breath of God. That when you open this book, he opens his mouth. When you open his heart, his spirit comes. And one of the most habits I did during my depression that changed my life is I read the Psalms every day. And when they were angry Psalms and sad Psalms, man, I related. And then there were Psalms just about his goodness and his mercy and how his love is better than life. And I'm telling you, I've seen a lot and been through a lot in my mental health. And his love is better than life. And nothing separates it from him. Because here's the thing, friends. We said it over and over. It's the refrain of the sermon. God is not done with you. Even when you're done with you. So turn to him. And bring him who you really are. Accept his help. Go to counseling. We have a great counseling service we can refer you to. They're great. Maybe you need to go see your doctor. Do your homework before you need to do medicine or anything like that. It's not a sin to take medicine. Take all the ways. Take a nap. Change your diet. Do all the things and receive them all as gifts from the Lord who cares for you, who wants to come close to you and whisper his love into your heart. Let's pray. with your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're, you're a follower of Jesus today. I, I don't know what the Lord said to you today, but maybe just talk to him what he's talked to you about. Maybe you're not depressed, but you don't feel 100%. Maybe just ask him to refresh you right now. Or restore to me the joy of my salvation. Remind me of your love right now. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. That's what he was sent to do. Holy Spirit, help me. Help my mind think clearly about God's wisdom. Help my heart. Help me. And maybe you're here and you never had an experience like my dad told me about where you surrendered your life to Jesus. You realized that you needed him to forgive you of your sins, to be right with God. And you never said, Jesus, you're now the leader of my life. You're my Lord. There's going to be a prayer on the screen, the prayer that was up earlier. You can just make those words into your words right now. It just gives you something to say. It gives you kind of just some, some, some handles on it. But really in your heart, it's, just, it's a posture of your heart saying, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I give myself to you. And if you do that today, you need to tell somebody. I gave my life to Jesus for the first time today. I'm going to pray for you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you, the one true triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, three in one, make your presence known to us now. Some of us in this room need your comfort. Some of us in this room need your encouragement. Some of us in this room need to sense and feel and experience all the dimensions of your love. Increase our heart's capacity to hold your love within us and to understand it, to taste and see that it's better than all things. Lord, some of us are, we feel bound up. And I pray, Holy Spirit, Come now in Jesus' name and remove the chains that some people feel just are kind of around their souls, that they're dragging along with them. Set captives free right now. In your gentle, powerful way. Refresh us, renew us, restore us. Help us be a community that that loves people when they're not okay. 
and lovingly says, God's not done with you. And helps them take their next step. Help us be those kind of people. We worship you now because you're worthy of our worship. We worship you now because in worship, we are reminded of how good and great you are. It helps tear down the false thoughts. and It renews our mind with your wisdom and your word when we sing it. So we sing words now that are true about you to you so we might commune with you. Make your presence known to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Let's sing this song together.